Okay, welcome back. We're almost at the point where we can solve our first fluid mechanics problem using the Navier-Stokes equations, and I'm really excited about this. But before we finish off this problem, I want to go back and recap the steps that we followed to get here. First, I presented a foolproof process that you can follow to examine these problems, break it down into the coordinate system, the driving force, and the boundary conditions, and use that information to simplify the conservation equations. In other words, the conservation of mass and the conservation of momentum, which is Navier-Stokes equations, and reduce them into a form that you can then solve. I then showed you how to apply this in the context of flow through a pipe. We use cylindrical coordinates and we establish that it's pressure driven flow and we propose some boundary conditions uh, associated with the flow. Then we went through and evaluated based on our decisions about the velocity, the flow direction, and the direction in which the velocity varies, which components are the most important. We then evaluated the conservation of mass and the Navier-Stokes equations and we found that when we did that we could reduce the problem considerably to basically a second order differential equation uh, which coupled with the boundary conditions that we already posed can then be solved to find the velocity profile. Vz is a function of r. Before we did that uh, I then uh, sort of took you through how we talk about this pressure gradient term. Uh, we know from our analysis of the Navier-Stokes equations that this pressure gradient is constant but some confusion can arise in terms of the sign of this of this quantity because in order to have a flow in the positive z direction of we, as we've defined it here that requires a negative pressure gradient. The pressure has to decrease as we go from a lower value of x to a higher value of x and sometimes we use this pressure drop term delta p to talk about this because this is a positive quantity. So now starting from this point we can again look at the differential equation that resulted from our analysis of the Navier-Stokes equations and proceed to work toward the solution. So here I've written it both uh, either in terms of the pressure gradient uh, as we um, as we originally uh, obtained from the Navier-Stokes equations and notice that I've replaced the partial derivatives with the uh, regular derivatives here uh, the, the, the lowercase d's uh, because we know that this is only a function of z uh, right from our analysis of the Navier-Stokes equations or I can write this in terms of the pressure drop p1 minus p2 which is a positive quantity but then I have to add a, a minus sign in front of that and so now what I have here is a second order ordinary differential equation for v sub z is a function of r. And this is such, uh, this has a form such that I can solve it by integration. Now as a first step I'm going to bring this 1 over r term or this mu over r term over to the side that contains the pressure drop because I want to just have only this derivative term on the left hand side and then all the other terms on the right hand side. And so now I'm going to integrate both sides with respect to r. So on the left hand side then this derivative uh, I just get the quantity inside the derivative that's r dvz dr and again uh, I've replaced the partial derivatives with uh, with derivatives uh, with the, the lowercase d because I know that vz is only a function of r. I've established that and the integral on the right hand side the integral of r is r squared over 2 and I also have a constant of integration c1. Now I'm going to bring this r on the left hand side over to the right hand side. So I'm going to divide both of these terms by r. So I have minus r over 2 mu delta p over l plus c1 over r. And now I'm going to integrate both sides again. So on the left hand side I get vz. And on the right hand side I have an integral of r again which is r squared over 2. So I have r squared over 4 mu delta p over l plus c1. And the integral of 1 over r is natural log of r. So I have c1 times the natural log of r plus another constant of integration C2. So I'm going to call this whole equation star so I can refer back to it later. Now I've obtained the solution but I need to evaluate these integration constants and I can do that by applying these boundary conditions. So that's the next step. 
and I'm going to do that here on the right hand side of the screen. So the first boundary condition we have is at the outer walls. At r equals a, the velocity goes to zero. That's the no slip condition. So I can substitute this into equation star. So the velocity is zero, bz is zero, so zero, and then wherever I see an r, I substitute an a. So I have zero equals minus a squared over four mu delta p over l, plus c1 natural log of a plus c2. And so I can solve this for c2 just by bringing these other two terms onto the left hand side. So I get c2 uh, equals a squared over four mu delta p over l minus c1 times the natural log of a. Okay, so now I have an expression for the constant c2. Now let's apply this second boundary condition which says at r equals zero the velocity is finite. So at r equals zero, let me substitute this into equation star again. So I have an r uh, in the first term and an and uh, so that's zero. And what about the second term? Now let's look at the second term more closely because if I substitute in zero into this natural log, this function diverges, it blows up. Uh, natural log of zero goes to minus infinity, I think. So that doesn't make sense. We know that the velocity at the center line in this pipe can't be infinite. That's just doesn't make sense. So based on this intuition, we know that the velocity has to be finite everywhere inside the pipe. And the only way that that can be the case is if I make the constant C1 equal to zero. Otherwise, this term will diverge at the center line. And we know that that can't happen. So based on our intuition, and based on this boundary condition that the velocity has to remain finite within the pipe, we can infer that the constant C1 is equal to zero. So now we have a value for C1 and C2. Actually, the second part goes away. Now we can substitute these back into equation star and get uh, expression for the velocity profile. So this is finally the solution to the problem that we want to obtain. So we get Vz as a function of r is equal to minus r squared over 4 mu delta p over l plus a squared over 4 mu delta p over l. That's a constant c2. And then we can uh, group some of these terms to make the result look better uh, or look more uh, attractive, I guess. Uh, depends on your, your aesthetic. But we, anyway, we can collect terms and we get uh, this expression that I have shown in the box. a squared over 4 mu delta p over l times the quantity one minus r squared over a squared. This is the solution for the velocity profile inside the pipe. And notice that it's a parabolic function. It depends on r squared. We can also check to see if this satisfies the boundary conditions. For example, at the wall, at r equals a, we know that the velocity is zero. So if we substitute a into here, uh, r equals a, then we have one minus one is zero, so it gives us zero velocity at the walls, so that's good. And at the center line, r equals zero, we substitute that in here and we get that the velocity at the center line is a squared delta p over four mu l. So it doesn't diverge, it doesn't go to minus infinity, so that's good. So this gives us, finally, an expression for the velocity profile uh, in the pipe. Now another useful quantity that we often want to obtain is the flow rate, uh, either the volume flow rate or the mass flow rate. And remember those are related by the density because the volume flow rate is volume per time and the density is mass per volume. So if I multiply density times volume flow rate, I get mass per time. And remember our definition of the volume flow rate was the integral over the cross-sectional area of v dot n. So this gives us the component of the flow that's passing through the surface, right? The projection of the velocity onto a vector normal to the surface. So this gives us the flow through the pipe cross-section. So if we look here in this geometry, our normal vector associated with a cross-sectional surface in this pipe is a unit vector in the z direction, right? The normal to this sort of disk-shaped surface 
uh, at any location is parallel to the z direction. So our normal vector is e sub z, the unit vector in the z direction. And we know already that the velocity is also in the z direction. And it's only in the z direction. Remember, that was uh, back in step one of our procedure. We showed that, or we argued at least, that uh, the z component of velocity is the only one of interest for this problem. So v dot n, in this case, is just vz, because they're both in the same direction. So our integral of v dot n dA is just the integral of vz as a function of r dA. So if we can integrate the velocity distribution over the cross-sectional area, then we can determine the flow rate. Now, in order to simplify this process, we can take advantage of the cylindrical symmetry uh, in the problem and be able to reduce this integral over the area into, from a double integral into a single integral. And again, this may be old hat to some of you, but uh, I want to show you sort of how I think of it when uh, integrating over a, a cylindrical surface. So you can imagine that if I take this surface and, and show it here, that I have this circular cross-section of diameter 2a. And if I imagine that I'm at some distance r from the center, and I consider some thin ring that's of width dr, and it's located at some distance r from the surface. So I want to know what's the area of this thin disk. And one way you can think about it is if you imagine cutting this ring with the scissors and then stretching it out. And what you would have would be a rectangular surface, which is shown here. And the length of this would be the circumference of the circle. And the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. So this is the length of the rectangle. And the width is this differential width dr. So now I know what the area of a rectangle is. It's the length times the width. So the area of this differential element, dA, is equal to 2 pi r, the length, times dr, the width. So with this construction, I can reduce the area integral to an integral just over r. So again, if I'm clever about how I choose my coordinates and my uh, differential elements that I'm going to use to do the integration, then I can uh, simplify the integration. You'll see that strategy again and again uh, in solving these problems. So now we can substitute in to our expression for the volume flow rate. So first we substitute in our expression for the velocity profile that we just derived. Uh, a squared over 4 mu delta p over L times 1 minus r squared over a squared times dA, which is 2 pi r dr. Then we can multiply through by this r and factor out everything else that remains constant. And we end up with an integral of this term, r minus r cubed over a squared dr. So the integral of r is r squared over 2, and the integral of r cubed is r to the fourth over 4. And those are evaluated from 0 to a, because we're integrating from, zero to the, from r equals 0 to the sidewall. So we can go through, uh, substitute in, and simplify this. And we end up with the result that the volume flow rate is equal to pi a to the fourth over 8 mu times the pressure drop delta p over l. So this is the equation for the volume flow rate of fluid flow through a pipe of radius a and length l due to a pressure drop delta p applied from the inlet to outlet. This is a very important equation, and we're going to see this come up uh, again and again uh, later on in the course. Uh, it's the basis for a lot of uh, correlations and a lot of expressions, and you can see uh, this very strong dependence on the radius. This is something that you can notice uh, almost every day. So for example, you go to a restaurant like uh, McDonald's, uh, at least here in the US, uh, the straws that they give for their drinks are, are pretty large uh, in diameter. And so it's pretty easy to drink uh, quickly uh, using those straws. Now if you imagine trying to drink at the same flow rate to consume the same volume of your beverage in the same time using a much thinner straw, like those kinds that you use to stir coffee, you would have to apply much more suction to drink at the same speed with that smaller straw. And that scaling is to the fourth power. 
So it's a very strong dependence uh, on the uh, on the radius. So for example, if you cut the radius uh, of your of your um, of your straw in half, you need to apply two to the fourth or sixteen times the amount of suction to drink uh, at the same speed. So it's a very important result. And again, it all comes from our solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations that allowed us to obtain the velocity distribution. Once we have that, we can integrate it over the cross-sectional area to obtain the volume flow rate. And we can multiply this by the fluid density to get the mass flow rate also.